Welcome back, everybody. I hope you enjoyed lunch and had some conversations with some interesting people that are here. Um, now we have Aaron Finon, aka Finox. Uh, if you are IDS vendor or IPS stuff, probably you should have bribed him by now with a bottle of whiskey. If not, probably it's too late, so enjoy the talk. Well, thank you for joining us at Alba 13 Con, and welcome to the Phoenix track, because we've all seen that I'm doing lots of talks today. Um, but thank you for joining us after lunch. It's, uh, it's always a quiet period in the conference world. So, I'm going to talk to you about IDS. I'm going to talk to you about IDS evasions and the history around that. I'm going to just kind of talk about some of the stupid stuff that we've come across over the years, and why they fail, so on and so forth. Um, there's a talk that I'm doing afterwards about uh, IDS, IPS testing to actually make them effective. Um, so, I'm going to talk to you about network intrusion prevention systems, the dead technology. Because we've all got next gen now, haven't we? So, the network intrusion prevention systems are basically burglar alarms for networks, I think is probably the most layman term of way that I can describe them. Now, I'm as guilty as everyone else in the, the IPS industry. I use the term IPS when sometimes I mean IDS. Uh, and I use IDS sometimes when I mean IPS. Nine out of 10 times it doesn't make much of a difference because detection is detection is detection. But sometimes it makes it critically important. We'll, I'll talk about that in the next talk that we're doing. So IDS evasion techniques. IDS has been around for a really long time. I've been talking about testing for four or five years now. Um, and I get this question every time. You're not worried the IPS industry will become like the antivirus industry. You'll just follow a set of tests. And you have to remind people, actually, the antivirus industry is becoming a lot like the IPS industry, because the IPS industry came first. It's older. Few people realize that. Um, DARPA was involved in this in the late 70s. Um, the first commercial deployment that I can find through research is around 82. Well, the first vendor that starts selling products is around 82. The first antivirus vendor that I can find is around 86, 87. So there we go. They're more like us. Now, normally when I do talks, we get two sort of responses that people are not interested because we all know IPS is dead and fails, or people are generally interested, one or the two. But detection is a complex business. It's not easy. But the fact that we suck at it is pretty bad. I watched a, a really interesting talk by uh, a guy from Facebook. It goes by the, the name Four. And he did a talk at Hash Days. I think he did it at Black Hat, too, um, called Detection Along the Kill Chain. Any of you that's dealt with vendors before, you'll love that term. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that later on. We did some research with the Mirandi and, and Verizon reports about you know, compromises of big organizations. Really interesting stuff. And in most cases of compromise, compromise takes months to years to be detected. That's just the general truth of it. You know, if you don't detect it straight away, chances are it's going to be 6 to 18 months before you do. Ouch. Not a good day. Uh, the cases of detection, what happens the most normal way that a compromise in the, these big, big organizations is detected is by the user going, oh, there's something with my computer that just doesn't seem right. So the smell test, basically. It doesn't feel right. Turns out there's a compromise. The next big detection is third parties. What do you mean third parties? I mean the bank calls you up and says, why are you transferring half a million dollars to a Malaysian bank account? That is the biggest indicator of compromise, according to these reports. After that, random log review. 
random person randomly looking at logs, is picks up compromise 8.5% of the time. Have you noticed that I haven't mentioned IDS at all yet? IDS picks up compromise in these reports 3.5% of the time. Let's put some context to that. Random dude, randomly checking, random log, is more successful than billion dollar industry. Well, we've been doing it for nearly 30 years, and it, uh, we're successful 3.5% of the time. Why don't we just turn it off, to be honest with you? Um, now, the problem with this is, is that when you see NSS testing, now I'm not sure how many of you guys know about NSS testing labs, I hope a few of you do. If we look at typical testing with NSS, they take like big vendors, about 10 of them, do a report. First round testing with NSS, what do we think the success rate if we fired a, a hundred threats at a, at a top tier vendor IPS product? Uh, feel free to shout some numbers out, but how successful do we think it is? We'd like to say 100%, wouldn't we? I mean, let's be honest with you, that's what we're paying for. Protect you against all the known zero days. 22% detect, the top tier will detect on average 22 threats out of 100. It's a bit poor, to say the least. Of course, you can be a little bit uh, cynical. Any of those that have known me will know that I could be described as a cynical individual. Um, I think it may be unfair criticism. But if we look at what these, these uh, vendors do out of these 22 or so, but it turns out to be that maybe 15 out of the 22 tend to be a false positive. So, okay, you can look at it two ways. Congratulations, you stopped the attack, pat yourself on the shoulder, we're awesome. Or we can say, well, a false positive is a false positive. You don't get to count a win. Your name is in the name you detect, and you've sucked at detection, right? Just because you got the consequence right, you didn't get your business right. So that's pretty bad. That's pretty, pretty scary. These things are deployed in numerous of places. They'll talk a little bit about how much the industry is perceived to be worth. You know, people for a dead technology, remember? Second round testing with NSS, when they bring in their, their engineers to tune it up, what do we think the average detection rate becomes then? They go up into the high 90s. Okay? No one's ever got 100%. Well, that's not true. No one's ever got 100%, but I'll talk about that story later on. But <clears throat> it goes to show you that when you put an engineer with these products, these crap products that are only 3.5% of the time successful, that we can actually start to make them effective. You know, at the end of the day, we can't just... I've heard for, for years now that the IPS industry is dead, and yet here I am again for the third year, still talking about it. You know, it's not dead, don't kid yourself. Most of, how many of you, by straw poll, stick your hands up? How many of you have uh, look after an IPS product of some sort? Okay, that it? Just four of you. Wow, you guys are really boring if you've come to an IPS talk and don't look after IPS. <laughs> See what I'm going to do next time? I'm going to make you all raise your hands, and if you haven't, I'm going to make you put them down again. That's what I'm going to do. At least then I'll feel like people are listening to me. But yeah, an IPS. And the reality of this situation is, is that systems get popped all the time and no one ever really blames the IPS. You know, example, better safe than Sony, as we like to say. You know? Sony, in the low sec area, 17 times they were penetrated, at least. They had an IPS. Do you know why I know they have an IPS? Because PCI. They need a third party application scanner. There was credit card data stolen. What do we do? We blame Sony for not having a CSO, but we don't blame Sony for buying a product and having their vendor completely let them down. Sony were in the front line of that, not the vendor. It's almost like this, this dead technology gives you immunity to being shockingly poor. 
Um, I have, for a number of years, gone on about almost the IPS cartel. You know, the, it's almost like IPS fight club, you know, IPS club. Because what happens is, is no one talks about detection, right? So the first rule of IPS club is, don't talk about detection. The second rule of IPS club is, don't talk about detection, okay? Now let's put this into context. This is like a sports car industry talking about its GPS, okay? If you speak to a vendor, all you get is throughput, throughput, throughput. We can handle 10 gig, full, full Jupax. We can handle 10,000 simultaneous connections. Yeah, but what do you detect? Well, well you know, we, we, we can have uh, 10,000 user profiles. Yes, but what do you detect? Every time I speak to a vendor about this, because I'm, I'm independent, I'm not vendor-led, when I speak to them, what's your detection rates? Well, you know, um, well, that's a, that, that's a tricky question. No shit, of course it is. But what do you detect? Well, it depends on the sort of attacks you're talking about. Well, I'm obviously talking about the malicious bad ones. Um, that's the ones that I'm really interested in detecting. I'm not so interested in detecting the poor ones that don't do anything bad. It's really the bad things I'm sort of interested in. So what's your detection rate there? And uh, you can imagine the answers I get. Like I say, if you're a vendor, things are not going to get any better for you in this talk today. So <clears throat> IDS evasion techniques. I, I re when I left university, I was doing one of these lovely terms, ethical hacking. I did a degree at the Abate uh, University in Dundee. I was a mature student. Well, that's a bit unfair. Mature just means I was old. I was never mature. I was a pretty much the immature student. But I had a lot of fun. And then in my third year, I was poached by a testing company. Not a pen testing company, but an IDS testing company. They wrote testing software. Um, pro a product called Traffic IQ. It's pretty cool, actually. And they wanted me to do some attack research. And what Traffic IQ did, does, is uh, it gives you a whole host of, uh, of malicious traffic that you can play over an IPS to see what it detects. And it gives you an independent report back so you can say, hey, you only detected 22% of our attacks. That's how NSS, that's one of their big clients is NSS. So when I started this, I was asked to document the known IDS IPS evasion techniques. Well, obviously, that's a, a pretty stupid statement because it's pretty hard to doc document the unknown ones. But my job required me to do uh, IPS. I was an attacker, you know. Pop the boxes, get root or die trying. You know those guys. Woohoo! Zero day, zero day, zero day. So eventually, I became a defense guy. It's a very weird change, but it's very fun. Actually, I enjoy it a lot more. So I went through the list of the, IP, the IDS evasion techniques that we knew about, that we had samples of. That was a good place to start. And what we discovered really quickly is most of the first IDS evasion techniques start to come back to 96, around this time. 95, 96 is really the heyday of screwing over IPSs and writing lots of paper on it. And I think this is the beginning of the dead technology culture that we give a blank pass to IDS on. And the first bunch of IDS evasion techniques that we saw really weren't that complex. What they really did was play the IPS or the IDS against the actual protocol itself. Because surprise, surprise, implementers of detection technology can be a little bit lazy because they've obviously got management that uses that ship it mentality. I don't know, just get it out to production. What could possibly go wrong? Oh, right, okay. So we started looking at HTTP evasion techniques. And a lot of these are pretty cool. Nowadays, they really shouldn't be effective. But some of them are. Some of them are really just the case of, of the protocol itself, like HTTP chunk. It's really a difficult solution for an IPS fan to look at. Because if you look at like using, uh, using like HTTP compression and using gzipped, 
or something like that. At least in the packet, it tells the IPS, hey, this is our content. This is how much this payload is going to be. So the IPS knows, hey, this is how much I need to buffer. And this is how much I, you know, I know I need to store it here. And this is how I'm going to analyze it for the threat in here. It doesn't get the same break with HTTP chunk because there is no transmit. It doesn't give you the size of the HTTP payload. It just sends you chunked data. That's a big issue for HT, that's a big issue for IPS because you have two choices. Deny all HTTP chunked. Great, you've just lost streamed media off the internet. Brilliant. I'm sure your users would absolutely love that. Or we buffer everything. Your storage is cheap. Well, it's not that cheap. I mean, if you're gonna buffer everything that I send you before you analyze it, and I'm a little bit of an IPS troll. You can get your, I'll give you three guesses what I'm going to do, but you're probably only going to need one. That I'm going to sit there and throw you junk data until you fall over. Wow, what's the worst that could happen? You stop detecting. That's the worst that can happen. I recently went on an assignment. It's a, it's a side story. I recently went on an assignment. And what really pisses me off with IPS in a lot of ways is that when it fails, it tends to fail open. So you route all this traffic through this IPS. And then when you break the IPS, instead of all the traffic stop working, it just gives up and becomes a router. Well, that's a little bit of a problem because nine out of 10 times, someone's attacking you if they're knocking your IPS over. You know, they're pretty robust. Remember, we're an industry that talks about throughput. We're pretty good at network engineering because that's all we ever talk about. We never talk about detection rates. Because we've already, I mean, how many of you, raise your hands, all of you, please. Right. How many of you have ever got a detection rate out of a vendor if you haven't put your hands down? No, exactly. Do you know what I mean? We only ever talk about throughput. So we know how to handle network data. We don't just fall over. I saw an amazing term recently. I say recently, about a year ago. We have, H we have layer two recovery. When we, when we fail, we have layer two recovery. Really? You mean that you become a router? No, we have layer two recovery. You fail open. No, we don't call it that. We call it, we call it layer two recovery. It's like, no, no wonder people don't trust us. You know, I say us, I've never sold a, an IPS. I've made recommendations, but I've never sold one. Maybe I should get into it, we'll make some money. There's a lot of money to be made in IPS, I can, I can assure you. Some of these evasion techniques are pretty cool, but a lot of these have started off with just sending a few hinky packets. An IPS and IDS really kind of has this static string analysis. I mean, really what it is is a glorified version of like, net, like grep, really and say, hey, I've got a GET request with this evil web page, and it's HTTP 1.1. Let's send the alarm. Whoop, 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 right? Send the cyber fire trucks. Well, it's really interesting, because when you start screwing around with static string analysis, what happens is you screw up your detection capabilities. So it was discovered by P. Takinushim, you and, and a few other people have done this, and you know, Traffic IQ has it. Uh, I think Nikto has these evasion, some of these evasion techniques in it, Nikto the web scan. Um, you know, stuff like, you know, if you think about a, a, a HTTP request, you know, get webpage.html, HTTP 1.1, okay? By changing the point to a comma, it was discovered that the IPS was evaded, right? One, one point, just changing it to a comma. Invalid version numbering, okay? I'm gonna do get webpage.html, HTTP 1.3. Guess what, static string analysis fails again. All that happens at the web server is it just drops to, because there isn't a HTTP version 1.3. All that happens is because of the protocol, the web server falls back and gives you the next supported version, 1.1 you still get your evil web page.html. But your IDS system was getting evaded. You can start to see 
really how sucky we were, and still are in a lot of ways, at detection. Because we write these stupid, we have a look at a problem, and we kind of look at it really narrow-minded. We don't think out of the box, and we end up getting caught out. Directory self-referencing, oh my god, how on earth did directory self-referencing evasion techniques still, you still see them work. I've still seen them work on site. And it's like, wow, this shit's old. What the hell are you playing at? Even case sensitivity is a problem for these detection systems. So 96 is the heyday. There's a really interesting paper by Pete Tak and Newsham. Um, I can't remember the title of it off the top of my head, but it like, if you type in HTTP evasions into Google or Bing or whatever, maybe not Bing, um, you should be able to find it pretty easily. Um, and this is like the daddy of IDS evasion techniques. Really what starts after the HTTP stuff is, we start to see protocol ambiguities. And protocol ambiguities are an interesting, uh, interesting issue. Um, this is when we define a network protocol in a request for comments document, an RFC. Woohoo! Tells, tells the implementer everything it needs to. But the problem is, is when the, implement, when the RFC authors are not black and white in the document, what happens is they leave the implementer to make their own mind up. Well, what could possibly go wrong with a lot of people implementing a defined standard and doing what the hell they want? You know, yeah, I mean, obviously, the unforeseen issues from this are massive. When I was talking about protocol ambiguities a couple of years ago, someone said to me, your IPS needs to be like a web server. I said, no, it doesn't. Yes, it does. It needs to be able to see web server traffic. It needs to, it needs to act like a web server. No, it doesn't. It needs to act like every single web server that's ever been before it, right? Because otherwise, any protocol ambiguity inside of that web server, right, the, 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 the IPS itself needs to understand those differences. We see a lot of these differences. And the problem we get is we have this kind of rule that we have when it comes to network protocol deployment, that we, when you develop a protocol, you send conserv conservatively and you receive liberally. What that means is be very, very strict in what you send out, be very, very open in what you receive, okay? Well, that's a real big problem for the IPS industry. The solution's an interesting one. It's like nuking from orbit, and I'll talk about that in a little second. But this receiving liberal stuff, this is why the semi this is why the colon works. Because the HTTP implementer says, hey, you're obviously, you're obviously meant this. We'll be liberal in what we receive. And of course, the IPS has, now has to have rules and to, to match that situation. But you don't really blame anyone for this. You know, at the end of the day, this is, this is what happens. There's nothing you can really do about it. And some of the really big issues is that you can also sort of understand that when you're writing a protocol, you're not technically using it. You're developing it because you're writing the protocol, you know. So you don't foresee future problems like if we have overlapping fragments, which flag takes precedence in the data set? Not clearly defined in the RFC. If you want to find a network protocol evasion technique, go and find an RFC and look for a gray area, and that's probably where you're going to find some issues. Because what happens is people like Windows and Unix guys develop their own solutions when it's not clearly defined. And of course, they tend to make different solutions. Overlapping fragments, TCP. Of course, Windows and Unix would have to do it differently from each other. If you, you, can, recite, you can rewrite data in a TCP stream, we call this an overlapping fragment. So which overlapping fragment takes precedence? You know, does the new data take precedence over the old data, or does the old data take precedence over the new data? Windows will always favor old data over new data. 
Unix will favor new data over old data. Which is really interesting, because that sounds like a really boring, geeky, I'm totally into my network protocols, I'm a nerd. Do you know what I mean? It, it, it kind of sounds like I'm going down this route here. But what it means is, is that the IPS, the IDS in this case, needs to be able to, you can make the IDS see one thing that you know will be reordered differently at the end point. Kind of feel like, you know, steganography in some ways. So you take this, you know, this get HTTP, you know, this get evil web page dot HTML, HTTP 1.1, you know, but we can now start to use overlapping fragments to change the name of that web page. And by the time it gets to our endpoint, we know it's going to be reordered differently. Our IPS sees one message and we deliver another message. And this is all about, long story short of this, this is all because in the RFC it's not clearly, clearly stated. You know, source port tricks. The, the old beautiful trick, it was discovered that IPSs or IDSs were not using the checksum, the IP checksum and the IP package, packets. Okay? So not only do we have an issue where we have protocols not clearly defined, we also have an issue that implementers knowing better. So the IPS guys that were writing like pre-processing for IP packets, the ROC pretty clearly states that if it has an invalid checksum, you drop that packet. Okay? Gone. Well, the IPS, they obviously know better. They just ignored that, which means that we can insert more packets into pre -proce into processing and we can hide an invasion underneath there. So that was kind of an interesting thing because what happens is, is you make this picture appear with all of these extra packets and as soon as it hits the internet with something that conforms with the standard, the, 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 the spurious packets, the camouflage is dropped and the payload is delivered. Cool. It was a, it was a lot of fun for, to find that out. Really, the, really this is the, the issue IPS really dealt with. You know, it needs to work out. It can't see what the endpoint is. And at the end of the day, it's just a device in the middle of a two endpoints. It's not the endpoint. It's not the endpoint. So it doesn't know what the endpoint is going to see. So it needs to make a, a choice about what, is it going to favor old data over new? Is it going to favor new data over, over old? Is it because you're ageist? You know, the, these things happen. IPS is in a real, real good place to fix this problem. Because for IPS, it's inline. And for IDS, it's passive. So IPS can use the, it's, this is almost like the alien scene. Because the only way for an IPS to know what the endpoint will see is to act like the endpoint, which means it needs to rewrite, pro rewrite protocols. We call this protocol normalization. Rewrite all the things. It's a bit of a nuclear option, in my humble opinion, having your security device that, bearing in mind, up until recently, didn't bother checking IP sums, uh, check sums in its IP headers. Now, all of a sudden, it is writing your data streams and sending that to an endpoint. But, long story short, it is probably one of the only effective ways of dealing with protocol ambiguities issues. And those issues are huge. I just touched on TCP. There's a number of protocols out there. I'm going to talk a little bit about SMB. Oh my god, that's even harder to do. Ask the Samba guys how hard it is to do SMB when it's not a defined protocol. That it's a de facto protocol. You know, I know some of the Samba guys, or did know some of the Samba guys. Very interesting people, I think. Um, but, you know, it's hard. It's hard to get to the bottom of it. Um, so protocol normalization literally decides it rewrites the packet and that and sends it to the endpoint in, in the place of what you sent. I did an assignment recently of an IPS test. I knew it was going to be a bad IPS test. I'll talk about bad IPS tests in the next talk, but I went on an assignment recently. And I knew it was going to be a bad assignment because it started off with, we'd like you to test our IPS. Okay, what would you like to test? 
the IPS. No, no, granted, I, I get that you want to test your IPS, but what do you want to learn? I don't know. Well, why are you testing the fucking thing? You know what I mean? I, it's got a flashy light. It's definitely an IPS. It's tested. You know, because if you don't know what you want them to do, then that's where the problem lies. So we get there, and just as I knew it was going to start off bad, it was a secured location. You know, I had to get driven to meet a chaperone. And I get there, and he says to me, I could really do with you not being here today. I'm like, you, you do know I have to travel from Scotland to do this. This is not being, I'm billing you either way. Send me home if you want, but your bosses are paying for this regardless of what happens. So when we go, I says to him, so, do you manage the IPS? It's in my data store. It's in, the, it's in, our, it's in our rack. Okay. Which one is it? I think it's this one. You think? Really? Yeah. Were you off when they installed it? No, no, I was, I was busy. They came in, they plugged it in, and then they walked off. And that was the deployment of an IPS on a secured network. Things get better. I says, <clears throat> you must deal with a number of network issues. It's a big network. Yeah? Yeah. I says, uh, do you ever check the logs of the IPS when you have network issues? No, why would I? Well, you do understand that this thing is on your network that you don't know which box it actually is. It's rewriting packets and you don't even know. It's like, really? Yes. This is what an IPS with protocol normalization does. It does not even factor into the guy that looks after the network's like problem solving. Now, I can guess there hasn't been any issues because at some point, some bright spot would have turned around and said, we should totally check the IPS, someone like me. There's another interesting part of this story. This is, why we des this is why the industry deserves to be named and shamed. So I speak to the, the head guy there. I said, so, what, what, your IPS, I'll not name the vendor. I will, but it'll cost you beer. So basically, I say to him, what have you got? You've got this IPS configured, deployed, OK. And then they tell me it's in, uh, it's in detection mode, not inline mode. So it's sitting in line, but it's not enforcing anything. It's just sending alerts if it sees anything. And this is the subtle difference, the difference between IPS and IDS. Throughput is critically important to us. OK, we have a secret network underneath that has encrypted end-to-end -end communication. OK, so why the fuck did you buy an IPS? Why did you not buy an IDS? You know, you want this passive piece of equipment, but you've got this active piece of equipment to do it. Well, I'm not sure I get what you mean. Well, you know, if you, if you uh, had a sensor instead of an inline deployment, you wouldn't be worried about the thing falling over. Oh, so why did you buy an IPS like that? Because the vendor told us we needed it. Wow, it must be the first time that a salesman has oversold something, eh? You find this with government contracts all the time, by the way. It's the only industry that I, can, I know where, certainly in Britain anyway, that the client has to ask you what they need. You know, I need to conform to this. What do I need? Well, let me get the checklist out. <laughs> uh, and it happens all the time. There is another thing that really kind of pisses me off. How many of you are PCI guys? Fucking PCI. <laughs> right? I am so sick of dealing with once a week, there, thereabouts, someone saying to me, I've just discovered an IPS deployed between two encrypted endpoints. Endpoint, endpoint, IPS. Now, what that means is, is that they're monitoring encrypted traffic with no means of decrypting it. You really know it's good when they turn around and say, we've never had, we, we don't get any false positives. <laughs> do you get any, do you ever get any true positives? No, fucking funny that. You know, if you have an, if you show me 
someone with an IPS that doesn't have a false positive, and I will show you someone who's configured their IPS wrong. You know, pure and simple. This is, in some ways, the knowledgeable ones know what's going on here. But what happens here quite a lot of the time is required to have a third-party application scanner. Okay. Required not to break an SSL tunnel. Okay. So what's the third-party application scanner for if it can't see the packets that it's looking for bad things for? Well, you should have one. Yeah, I, I get that, but you're crippling the device's effectability. A friend of mine called me up recently. Fucking beautiful story. You know you're a sad geek when you have people call you up and tell you stories about IPS, right? He calls me up and says, dude, you have to listen to this. This is fucking brilliant. I'm like, what, what is it? I've just been in a meeting where I heard one of the engineers saying, what we should do is we should SSL encrypt all the traffic and that will take the load off the IPS. <laughs> SSL being used as a load balancer. The why don't you just think green, turn the fucking thing off, right? If you don't want it to look at any of the packets, Stop wasting the power cycles. Think of the, think of the environment. Think of your carbon footprint. Not only are you an idiot, but you're killing us all on the side of this, too. Thank you. And this annoys me. It's the most annoying thing that I have to deal with. I should have warned you at the beginning that I'm very uh, robust in my language. It comes from being from Scotland. We, uh, we tend to swear when we exhale. But yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a real issue. So some of the other evasion techniques that we see that I had a look at were SMB, DCE, RPC, right? So we've looked at issues where IPS guys ignore protocols. We've had a look at where protocol guys are liberal in what they accept. Now let's pick on Microsoft, I mean uh, uh, OS developers. <laughs> so <clears throat> DCE RPC, or we should just call it MS RPC, I think that's probably another name for it, and more true, more to the fact, an SMB. This represents a huge amount of corporate data flow, is SMB. Surprise, surprise, businesses like to use network shares. Wow. Who would have seen that coming? In other news, water is wet. So there's a number of evasion techniques because the protocol itself is not clearly defined. Because there is no RFC for it. It's a de facto standard. This is really interesting because <clears throat> a recent spate of advanced evasion techniques, and don't worry, I'll be getting ball deep in that in a second, but advanced evasion techniques and uh, a vendor scared the shit out of the industry. But we were pretty poor for DCE, RPC uh, pre-processing. I think that's maybe fair. And a lot of these evasion techniques you can find in places like Matasploit. And it really is a case of, certainly in the case of like the fake bind stuff, is actually playing the de facto standard against what it's supposed to do, against what really happens in the real world. Um, the case of SMB pipe IO evasion techniques, I'm really not going to get into because I've talked about this subject to the nth degree. But the reality of it is, is SMB is alive and kicking on your networks. And yet, how you detect for it is pretty poor. Thanks to a, 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 a snake oil vendor, we're a little bit better. But not because they did good research, because they scared the shit out of everyone with media hype. And then all of a sudden, big vendors are like, I'm not taking off that vendor. And they put some effort in. And all of a sudden, we started getting decent DCE RPC pre-processing. We started to get some rules. It was really interesting. And really, and the advanced evasion technique stuff is, so Stonesoft, a couple of years ago, told the industry that we have some new advanced evasion techniques. And the industry came together and said, what are they? And they said, we're not telling you. And we went, seriously? Seriously. Why are you not telling us? 
responsible disclosure, or as I like to call it, marketing bullshit. <laughs> so after about a year or two, finally the cat's out of the bag what exactly advanced evasion techniques are. Does anyone like to hazard a guess what an advanced evasion technique is? You take one really old evasion technique and another really old evasion technique, you put it together, and you make a new evasion technique. Right. For starters, no, you don't. Secondly, you panicked us all for that shit. We've been able to do that in Metasploit for fucking ages. Give us a break. Also, you haven't read the Achilles heel of detection systems. No, we haven't. I know you haven't. Why do you know we haven't? Because, surprise, surprise, the more you obscure your obfuscation, it looks a little bit obscure. You're sick, you, the paper goes into basically say you're six times more likely each evasion technique you add. Because, surprise, surprise, the detection surface gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And we've got more things that we can detect. So using advanced evasion techniques, there's a real high probability that you can be detected. Now, what I really enjoyed is being told that Stonesoft can, de can detect all the advanced evasion techniques. I should fucking hope so. They're your, detect they're your evasion techniques. Of course you can detect your own attacks. Who would have seen that coming? But an example of where this goes bad, TCP IP. Snort is pretty good at TCP IP. It's got a nice, it's got a nice, a nice preprocessor there. So you take DC RPC fragmentation, you say you do like 64 bytes, whatever. TCP, and a lot of these advanced evasion techniques are, are, are set to a really small default value, so let's say eight bytes, whatever. Well, what happens with people like Sourcefire who've got their head around that if you're sending me lots of really, really fucking small packets, there's probably something going on that I might want to put an alert to, right? So, something a little bit hinky. And the example of what happens here is that Snort wasn't picking up the DCE RPC fragmentation, but as sure as shit was picking up the TCP. And this is what I mean about increasing your detection space, right? If they hadn't have done it, you wouldn't have got caught for it. So obscuring your obfuscation is obscure, right? Evasion techniques are incredibly easy to detect, by the way. Stonesoft get purchased by McAvee, okay? Even John's not that crazy, you know? But McAvee recently themselves have been purchased by Intel. I have no idea what is going on there. I do get asked my industry opinion about it. And what I can say is, all I can say on the hand of my heart is, I really wish John McAfee was the CEO again. You know, what damage could he do? It would be epic. <laughs> we need a little bit of chaos, I think, you know? People miss low so we need a notter in charge, okay? But McAfee have been purchased by Intel, and what they do is then they buy Stonesoft for 200 million euros. Stonesoft don't have, you know, they're, they're not high up on my regards list. I, I presume that I won't be getting a Christmas card again off them this year. Um, but yeah, McAfee gets purchased. Well, the 200 million euros might sound a little bit big until you hear that Cisco purchases Sourcefire for $2.7 billion. You remember this dead technology that we've been talking about for 40 minutes? They just went out one day and said, hey, you know what would be really good? We're going to buy Sourcefire. Why? But don't worry, we're going to keep Snort alive. Yeah, we've heard you in open source products before. RIP Snort. It was nice while it lasted. The, the best that's going to happen, in my humble opinion, with Snort is it's going to get cut from Sourcefire and floated out to almost like what Oracle did with um, OpenOffice. They'll take it for a little bit, sever ties, push it back towards the community. Um, which, in essence, seems to make you kind of a little bit worried because we're going to probably lose a lot of support for the open source uh, IDS engines. But I've had clients speak to me. I get asked about this quite a lot. And I tell them not to panic, because A, Sourcefire, or oh, Cisco, are not the most fastest organization in the world, let's be honest with you. Like, they don't need to move particularly quickly to make markets change, right? They're big. We get this. Secondly, 
probably the purchase of Cisco is guaranteed, probably by purchasing the Sourcefire stuff is now going to be supported longer under Cisco than it probably would have done under Sourcefire. And secondly, the rules are not going to disappear anywhere. You know? Th that's what detection is. It doesn't matter about what your, your fancy dancy dev device does. I'm not out of time. I've got two hours. I've certainly not spoke for two hours. <laughs> it just feels that way. <laughs> but it's the rule set that really is detection. I'll talk about the, the, the importance of the rule set in the, the talk later on. So, but I get asked my opinion about this. And there's two things that are going to happen. So, Snort gets its cut off, right? Okay, brilliant. What we're going to see is we're going to see maybe industries pop up like emerging threats. So, because you don't have Sourcefire and Cisco uh, um, Snort pushing out rules to the open source community, we're probably going to see independent companies come along and do the same. But also, what's going to happen is the IDS Shirakata is probably going to get a lot more traction, which is interesting. Um, they're pretty cool guys, and they're doing some good stuff, but now they're going to get a lot more market pressure on them to actually do good. So I think they're the right guys for the challenges, truth be told. I just want to talk quickly about two more things, and we'll wrap up, OK? I like to talk about the common intrusion detection framework from time to time, just because I'm a detection geek. And the common intrusion detection framework has this really nice line in it, and I think it makes a lot of sense, about once you detect something, you should always detect something. You know, it's, that, it's, it's not a complex concept, right? If I picked it up, I should pick it up a million times. It just doesn't, shouldn't change. So, in comes IPS Club Vendor, okay? Throughput, 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 throughput. They have a device that buffers a thousand popular threats. I don't know where they came up with the number of thousand, but a thousand popular threats. Their throughput is amazing. All the stuff that's happening in the marketplace is happening. It's a popular attack. And then when, what happens when you get a new attack come out? Well, what happens is, what, what do we think happens when a new popular attack comes out? The one at the end just disappears. <laughs> Goodbye. So what you were detecting six months ago, 12 months ago, 18 months ago, you may not necessarily be detecting. In the case of this vendor, use old evasion techniques, uh, use old uh, attacks. You know, if you, you know, there is a lot of legacy systems knocking about. Not all attacks, uh, you know, if you're a big industry. But yeah, this is a detection system. You know, this is, this is what we're up against. Um, I don't think that's in product, but I do know it's still out in deployment. Kill chain, yay, cyber kill chain. I was very disappointed to find out that the cyber kill chain did not kill all the cybers. Um, <laughs> but the kill chain, I'm going to wrap up really quickly. The kill chain is an interesting thing. You're gonna, if you haven't had this shoved down your throat, you will. Okay. Cyber kill chain trademark. Trust me, it's coming if you haven't already had it. But surprisingly, what, how many of you guys have heard of the kill chain? Cool. Just do this for a second. <laughs> Basically, Lockheed Martin does some work with the military. Who would have thought that? And what they saw is they saw the military use this kill chain tactic. And the kill chain tactic is, surprisingly, when you want to kill someone, like, we, we don't call it kill, we, we call it, like, you know, target, you know, when you're a military trying to target uh, a bad guy, I'm not sure that's maybe the right way of describing it, but I'm sure you'll you'll give me the, the benefit of the doubt. There's a number of steps that have to be taken, such as finding the target, intelligence, such as guns. Because it's pretty hard to kill someone. I'm, I'm sure there's people that can kill people with their bare hands, but the military likes to have things that go bang, bang. Um, you need to get bang, bang to soldier. You need bullets. You need to be able to get to your target. These are all steps in a chain for you to finally get your target at the end. The, the American military, well, the military also discovered that what the kill chain was really good at was really good for defense as well. Because just as they had to find targets, just as they had to get guns, just as they had to get bullets, 
so does the bad guys. So if we intercept parts of that chain and break that chain, their end target. It's a very, very quick sum up of what the kill chain is. So Lockheed Martin decided that they can use this in detection. Because surprisingly, for us to, let's use one of these lovely terms that we all love, APT, which, call me old fashioned, just sounds like someone was trying to hack you. Um, it's not a worm, it's a person. We used to call that hacking, now we call it APT. Uh, it sells more boxes. But the reality of it is, is that for someone to attack you, you need to, you know, you need command and control. There's a point there that we can do some detection. You know, we need compromise. There's some points there that we can do detection. You start to see that if we're going, someone's going to try and attack us, there's key indicators along the line that we can put our detection capabilities in. Great, awesome. Then what did we do? We let the marketing guys get involved. And now, no one trusts the term kill chain. Really handy piece of technology. I know I'm running out of time, or have run out of time. He's looking angry at me. Um, so in wrapping up, all protocol, eva all protocol evasions really kind of stem, stem from like the heyday of the 90s. And really, how, proto how protocol like network of you know, IDS evasion techniques really come from is this one sentence, what if I? What if I change the case of the get? What if I use base64 encoding? What if I open up a named pipe and shove an SP, uh, SMB uh, payload down there and call a read pipe on it? What if I, that's the beginning. The problem is, is for nearly 30 years, the IPS industry hasn't been asking the same question. They've just been asking how we can sell more boxes. But the problem is they're going nowhere. If we can get this from this 3.5% mentality that's acceptable for an industry that we were just sold a, an IP, how do you make, a, how do you make a, your company, how do you increase the value of your company 1,100% in eight years? You become a detection company. That's how. Checkpoint offered 225 million for, for uh, Sourcefire. Cisco came back eight years later and offered 2.7 billion. 1,100% increase. For sucking, really bad, 3.5%. That's how good you are. So if we want these things to save the network kingdom, then we have to stop accepting failure as part of their job requirement. We have to hold them accountable. We have to stop, we have to stop, we have, a, we, the closest similarity that I can think of is that we have a car industry that sells GPS, that's basically what's happening to us. That basically we accept that the car sucks. You know, but if, if we look at any other industry, we would never accept that, it would never happen. So the role of testing is incredibly critical because it gives, it gives us the ability to hold things to account. And maybe once, like, you know, as I said earlier on in NSF, we can go from 22% up to the high 90s. I think we'd all be a little bit more comfortable with that. I'm going to do, I'm, I, uh, they, they were a short, they were a talk short, asked me if I could do one about actual testing and a bit more technical sort of stuff. Uh, I agreed to, and that'll be on in like another five minutes. But if you guys need to get a hold of me, these are my email addresses. Uh, much like Linus Torvalds, I uh, feel free to email me, and I'll feel free to ignore it. Um, but all joking aside, if you do have any questions, don't fancy sticking your hand up or anything like that, do feel free to email me. I'm a little bit busy, but I will try and get back to you. Um, but does anyone have any questions about any of the, the stuff that I've covered today? So, uh, since you're all here, uh, is Florian Gruno here? Uh, he should go to the registration desk. Uh, there's some reporters, I think. Uh, so, anybody has a question for now? About IDS evasion. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> that Which was fast. Amazing job, then. So, we make a short, I think, five-minute break, then we